where you boost the economy during a, a, a slump and you quieten the economy down during a, a boom. I'm talking here about permanently having the government pumping money into the economy, more during a slump than during a boom, but still normally running a deficit. I want to explain why. A bit of a thought experiment for you. Imagine we have a growing economy. Okay? And that means both real output is rising and the money supply is expanding. So you've got a growing economy. And you've got a balanced external sector. So you, your exports equal your imports, you know, payments overseas equal payments in, et cetera, et cetera. And the government decides to run a surplus. Well, how's it going to do that? If it runs a surplus, it's taxing the private sector. It's got to be claiming in more in taxes than it's paying out in subsidies. Now, for that to happen, the private sector has to pay those taxes. So the private sector is paying out more in taxes to the government than it's getting back in. Okay? And it also is expanding the money supply. So how does it do that? How does the private sector produce money? I don't mean goods and services here, I mean money. Okay. Well, the answer is, it has to borrow money. The, no, the, the non-bank section of the, of, the, of the private sector has to borrow money from the banks. And given that you want to have the government running a surplus and the economy continuing to grow as well, the borrowing the private sector has to do has to exceed the size of the government surplus. So if you want to have a government running a permanent surplus, which is the objective all governments these days seem to have, the corollary of that has to be an over-indebted private sector. Is that a good thing? Yeah, but that's the mindset economists have got us into, are thinking that running a surplus is a good thing because they ignore money. If I gave you an argument about macroeconomics and I didn't include money in it, which is what they do all the time because they don't have money in their models, they can talk about a surplus and it sounds like that's a great idea because you know, a household tries to save money and so should the government. But the reality is the government should normally run a deficit because the government actually is not like a household which has to get money in from somewhere else and save it to actually accumulate money. The government's like a bank. If the government runs a deficit, it produces money just as bank loans do, but it produces it without the side effect of increasing private debt. And there's no necessity for the government to have to fund itself through its own debt as well, by the way. It could do it, again, by having the Federal Reserve backstop what it's doing uh, by, by just producing the money. So we need to get to the stage where we de-demonise governments running deficits and we have an economics that focus on money, banks, debt and disequilibrium and dynamics. And that's what I hope Idea Asia can help us to do. So thank you very much. Thank you very much, Paul and, and Steve. Um, fantastic piece of software there. We can <laughs> see why you had to change the laptop. I don't think anybody else's laptop is capable of that. So. <laughs> Excellent. Guys, any questions from the floor? David. Sorry, David, I think we've just got a microphone because so everybody can hear the question. Pertaining to the third of the, of the, of the three basics, you mentioned economy is dynamic. And, and the reason why economy is dynamic is because, unlike the laws of physics, the laws of economics has a human element to it. And so I think a problem with economics today is we don't actually look at enough of the social and psychological components of, of what goes in economic decisions. I think um, when, I, what, when, I, when I look at economics, it doesn't, uh, people have different perceptions of whether debt's good or not, or whether you suspend. Some people want to be more independent, so they don't want the debt. And sometimes it's generational changes. And sometimes seeing these tools where you go back 30, 50 years, I think people's psychologies of how they, they view money is different than it was in the 1930s, as it was in the 1950s, as it is now. And so, um, so and, and, and I don't see, I still see ec economics uh, you know, as stuck in that, you know, and, and still using the same tools as they used 50, 100 years ago. And, and, and it's, um, and uh, I was mentioning to a few people earlier, um, when, when I looked at trying to be predictive on economics, I don't look for ag at an economics writings. I'm looking at, you know, social, uh, so sociology writings mm -hmm. and things like that. Um, one of my favorite books was The Social Origins of Dictatorship and Democracy. 
-hmm. And even to this day, it was written in the early 1960s. Mm -hmm. But even to this day, you may, maybe you can't, you can predict, with that book, you can predict economic crisis. It may not be how big it is, because it's not quantitative, mm -hmm. but you can predict it based on what, you know, social economic factors. And, and, and in your, and in your um, you know, in both of your presentations, you mentioned that, you know, uh, government tries to finesse things, you know, and think that, you know, they can control uh, the, um, the demand, control de on the demand side. And, and that's simply not the case. The, the psychological element is more powerful than that, you know. If, if I, I disagree. Um, the psychology is important, and part of Minsky's theory is how people's psychology changes over time. So he's got a very strongly and realistically psychologically focused theory. But the government, if the, if the government injects money into the economy, believe me, that changes people's psychology too. Um, one of the reasons Australia didn't suffer from the, a recession during the global financial crisis is because partly I panicked them into a, a pretty rapid fiscal response and part of that was to give a thousand dollars to every Australian with a pulse who paid their taxes that year. I qualified on the first but I didn't on the second. I didn't get my taxes done in time. But everybody got a thousand buck check and within a few weeks it was spent. Okay? And that both affected the state of the economy and affected people's psychology. So that it isn't just, you can't reduce it all to psychological factors but the psychology of neoclassical economics is a pathology as well. I mean, we need a realistic psychology as part of a genuine theory. And Minsky's got that with his idea about what he calls euphoric expectations. Mm -hmm. And if you go back to the 1950s, you will find that people had a very conservative attitude towards debt. I, I know from my own family experience, my father was a banker, mm -hmm. and my parents were incredibly conservative. I remember my mother going up and paying off stuff on lay-by. You know? They wouldn't touch debt with a barge pole. And when, mm -hmm. the, when the banks came around to the school when I was a kid, back in the 50s and 60s, they gave you little tin savings cans to put your coins in. Now they turn up with plastic credit cards with 50 bucks credit on them mm -hmm. for the kids. So the whole psychology of debt has changed the further we've got away from the crisis that gave that psychology in the first place, which was the Great Depression and the Second World War. So these psychological factors are affected by the state of the economy as well. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's what I mentioned, the social economic factors, because we, we talk about, you know, the income uh, uh, inequality and how, yeah. how that needs to be, be factored in. Yeah. And, and the, the psychology is not just on the individual level, it's on it's a community collective. level yeah. as well. Yeah. Um, so um, uh, actually, uh, uh, Paul w uh, actually sent me an article a few weeks ago on an economist talking about uh, c connecting the economic benefit with, the, with innovation. Mm. And, and, and I'm looking at, I'm reading the article written by an economist and, and have an experience seeing a startup community blossom here and, and, and seeing that she was trying to connect, well, a startup doesn't create that many jobs, so it doesn't have that much in impact. It's all mm. about how many jobs it creates. And I thought, well, it's, it's a little bit more dynamic. Little, it's not so simple as that. Mm. You, know, uh, you know, a government like a software park can come in. They create entrepreneurs. They don't create jobs. They create entrepreneurs that, that go on to create their own jobs and then create more jobs, you know. And, and a startup might only have 10 employees, but they can create, have far bigger economic benefit because a few champions can make, a, make a, a community a center of innovation and attract bigger companies to come mm. in. And so, so, so this is, it's an individual, it's a community, it, 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 it's, it is dynamic. And, and the economic tools and models that I see don't put that in. Oh, they've uh, totally, totally driven it out of, this, out of the argument. They, they, they assume it, uh, innovation comes from some exogenous source without explaining it. And they underrate the role of the government in funding innovation as well. I mean, it's not just entrepreneurs who fund it. You, innovation is funded by people who can afford to lose money. Okay? And that includes both large venture capitalists but also the government. If the government decides to stop losing money like that, we have a lower rate of innovation. So we need a combination of the two, definitely. <coughs> Pardon me. I think, um, I, th I think one thing about it is <coughs> there's an amazing cyclicality to human behaviour. Um, you know, if you look at um, if you look at Minsky's models, he, he talks about um, you know, he uses Kondratiev, Kondratiev ways and a lot of that. And uh, in, in a lot of these models, something like 50 years, 60 years tends to be the period over which you might expect um, debt deflations to to recur. If you go back a few thousand years, if you go back to biblical times, then that jubilees actually happened 
every 50 years. That's where we get the term from. Because again, that was that was the way of um, limiting debt getting out of control. So the, the kind of things, you know, Steve's talking about as a solution, the kind of things that Minsky put into his models, the kind of thing Kondraty have noticed, um, are maybe the timing varies slightly, but they're, they're essentially the same factors of human behavior, you know, cyclical human behavior modeled over time for thousands of years. Thank you for that. Guys, we are limited for time. Um, Steve's got an interview at 8.30, so we, we've, we'll take more questions, but can we keep them a little bit more yeah. brief than David's, if, if that's okay? <laughs> I, I can't imagine they're not going to be more brief than David's. <laughs> Pro promise it will be. It could be very brief indeed, uh, depending on the answer to the first bit, which is basically, have you already, um, I don't know, because I was late, sorry, but yeah. have you already um, talked about uh, Keynes and Hayek? And um, I'm just wondering basically where, you know, where, where, what do you think of the sort of ongoing debate of the past few years and how productive, unproductive, totally destructive it's been, and what, give, what, what would Keynes say now? Keynes, give, if, I, I give people quotes from Keynes, and they have a hard time distinguishing whether I've given a quote from Keynes or a quote from Hayek. Okay? It's only the bastardized Samuelsonian version that people think is Keynes that's anything like what they deride and say Hayek is much better. So it's the, it's the trivial, trivializing of, of Keynes's insights removing anything interesting and reproducing the stuff they could understand and calling it Keynes. That's, that's what you've got as so-called Keynesian economics. So it's been a waste of time, like most of those debates. Hi, I, I disagree with some of Hayek's theory of value, but he's, he's, he's got a dialectical, non-equilibrium focus to his thinking where expectations and uncertainty play an essential role, and I could use exactly the same sentence about Keynes. There's a, there's so a great... What, uh, what? There's a great quote from Minsky in, I think it was in the 80s or 90s when he was saying, you know, Amer American economists have ha been having this uh, huge debate, which was essentially the Hayekians versus the, the, uh, the Neo-Keynesians. Um, and um, he said, essentially, it's a, it's a bit of a waste of time because they're, they're, both, uh, they're both arguing sort of, you know, misunderstood versions of the same system. And, um, and, and it looks like that. If you look at, if you look at what uh, Hayek wrote, you look at what Keynes wrote, then uh, there's very, very, very poor correlation in the, uh, in the modern arguments that are built around so-called followers that are, that are basically all revolving around neoclassical economics and you know, non-debt uh, non systems, uh, DSGE, all, all, all this stuff that yeah, I don't think Keynes or Hayek either of them would have accepted. Given, given what you were, you were saying earlier, um, I mean, what, what do you think? Do you think Keynes would even get a, a look in, let alone the kind of uh, influential role he had? You know, the last time we had I problems was, like this. I was this. asked this uh, on BBC Radio recently, and I said he wouldn't get a job at a university these <laughs> days, let alone get the uh, impact he had. Not I even mean, Kingston. <laughs> I'd hire him, <laughs> but I, I wouldn't have got a job if I was applying, applying for a job these days. I wouldn't have got employed. I was lucky to get in when there's still a, a humanist core to the. Uh, academics who taught economics at the universities in Australia at the time. They got driven out in a five-year period just after I got my job. It's quite remarkable to see the tra transition. But no, anybody who doesn't assume what they call rational expectations, which I actually more accurately describe as prophetic expectations, won't get a paper published. And the whole, and this is actually one thing where you, business people could help here. Bureaucrats have become obsessed with trying to measure research quality. And they measure research quality by whether your articles get published in what the top ranked journals. They have four, four, four star, three star, two star, one star, and unranked. There's not a single non neoclassical journal, the journal that will accept anything other than neoclassical theory in the four stars. There's one in the three stars, which is the Cambridge Journal of Economics. Every other journal I can get published in has got two stars or one star. So I'm a low quality academic. And that's the sort of nonsense that happens when you let bureaucrats decide, you know, ranking standards. But also, it's the, it's, it, it wouldn't be as bad in physics or in chemistry or biology because at least the star ranking there would reflect, you know, a reasonable status in, in what's good and what's bad research. But in economics, it's what's neoclassical versus the rest. And that's, that would do, keep at high. None of, the, none of the main people we regard now as contributors to economic theory would get a job in an American university except Paul Samuelson. Thank you very much. Question from the gentleman over here. We seem to have got into a discussion of uh, neoclassical economics. Yeah. I would be more interested to know how we're going to get out, how the world, the Western world especially, 
is going to get out of the mess, to be mm. honest, that they've got themselves into or we've got ourselves into. We've been printing money like it's been going out of fashion. No, we haven't. This is one of the myths people... The, the, what, what has been happening is the Federal Reserve has been buying bonds off the banks, okay? That is the banks bundle together a whole lot of mortgages, make a mortgage-backed security, and then the Federal Reserve buys that at face value and you know, pays a premium for the damn thing. That's not money printing at all. Well, we're expanding the money supply. Pardon? We're expanding the money supply. No, we're not. Um, pardon me being interrupting yeah, yeah, you here. Go on. Okay. There, there are two large monetary systems. There's a monetary system you and I are in. If I wanted to buy that microphone off you, okay, I'd be taking money out of my bank account and giving it to yours. Now, if I bank with, say, the Bangkok Bank and you bank with the, with the Thai Bank, then my money coming out of my bank would mean the reserves of the, the Bangkok Bank would fall. And to transfer the money to you, the reserves of the Thai Bank would need to rise. Now, that's, that's where the money, so-called QE, is going. Okay? It's ending up in the deposit accounts of the private banks at the central bank. If you want to print money and put it in your pocket and my pocket, it's got to turn up in the deposit accounts of the private banks, which it's not doing. So there has been expansion of the... Like you have two circulation systems which overlap with each other when you need to make a payment from one person's bank to another person's bank. But it's not turning up in the liability accounts at all. Okay. So it's quite a fallacy to say that. But, why I'm but so that money, that. some money, has been leaking at ridiculously low rates into uh, inflating the... The asset prices. That's certainly been happening, and two ways that that happens. One is the banks themselves can buy those assets, and two, when you're buying mortgage-backed securities off them, they get rid of one asset, they can buy another. So yeah, it is sending up in the asset market. So in my opinion, then, we are destroying the fiat money system. Yeah, um, whereas what we should be doing is using the fiat money system to undo the damage being done by the credit money system. So how do we do that? That would be doing what I'm talking about, which is a transfer from the central banks and the government's capacity to create money straight to our liability accounts, which was actually allowed under Section 13.3 of the Federal Reserve Act. I believe it's been abolished recently uh, by the what, not the, what was it called, the, not the Glass-Steagall, but the new act that hit the Frank Dodd. Frank Dodd. As a side effect, they abolished Clause 13.3. But 13.3 let the Federal Reserve make a direct payment into people's deposit accounts at banks with a 70% majority vote on the Federal Reserve Board. Now, that what they could have done is do exactly what I'm talking about. Say, create, like, I'll use a rough figure, say, a, a trillion dollars, which is roughly the scale of the original rescue. Create a trillion dollars, put that into the deposit accounts, and then use any... That would then have cancelled one trillion dollars worth of private debt. So they could do it. Um, that, that's what I'd like them to do. But we have been, surely, would you not then agree that we... When I say we, I mean the West. It's been following the Japanese since 1990. They, uh, uh, um, with their economic system, have been um, in recession or near to recession mm. for the last 20 years. Mm. And we, in fact, when I say we, the West, mm. has put the same sort of policies into operation. Mm. And we're surprised when we get the same result. I know, I know. I, mean, I was looking at... I remember reading Ben Bernanke's stuff back in the 90s. And he, I've, I've got to find the original quotes. But he say, uh, what has happened in Japan could never happen in the transparent and well-managed American monetary system. <laughs> Unless you I let could, me in charge. I mean, the guy's yeah. got to... You've got to give him credit. He's a great straight man, <laughs> you know? Uh, and, of course, I was... Yeah, yeah, tell, pull, the, pull the other one. Well, I've... You know, 15, 20 years later, they've done the same thing and they're making the same policy mistakes. I wonder why he retired. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. I think his memoirs could make interesting reading, more so uh, than his academic papers did anyway. Somebody else's fault. Yeah. There's, 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 um, there's three basic options. You, um, you accept a proposal like uh, a modern Jubilee, which is a great idea, but uh, at the risk of upsetting Steve, I don't think it's going to happen in our mm. lifetimes. You um, you try to keep this this uh, terminal patient on uh, on life support for as long as you can, Japanese style, um, or at some point you accept that this isn't working and you um, and you have some form of a reset 
uh, in which asset values get written down, debts get written off, and you start all over again. Um, in the 1930s, that's what they did. Unfortunately, the, the reset mechanism was a thing called World War II. Hmm. Lovely. <laughs> did we have a question at the back over there? Can we just pass the microphone over if you can, guys? Hello. Uh, my background in economics is uh, having taken a course based on Samuelson's textbook about 52 years ago. We, we won't hold it against you. <laughs> <laughs> so it, it seemed pretty reasonable to me. And then uh, I was just aware from following the news that in around 1970, Milton Friedman became very prominent. And then the whole uh, drift of economic discussion in the United States changed. Uh, I don't know why, why he got so, so much uh, support and publicity. Of course, you've uh, re referred to some other individuals. But uh, the, the question is, why have the, has academic economics become so intractably uh, perverse? or right-wing, or whatever other way you can describe yeah. it. Is there a vast right-wing conspiracy, uh, like outside factors, like? Uh, there's, there's some people who argue that, like Phil Murawski argues that a large part of the mathematics that was developed that's part of neoclassical economics now was developed by the Rand Corporation, uh, largely to help with armaments and, 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 and gun targeting during the Second World War. And then those optimization techniques, which makes sense. If you want to drop a bomb on a bunch of Germans, you know, you need to know the trajectory and get it right and optimize the path, et cetera, et cetera. And then those same techniques were then developed and taken across to economics. And he sees a lot of the funding of that as being where they got the intellectual muscle they did because their technical level went well beyond what the rival schools were doing. That's partly a conspiracy theory explanation for it. It also played a perfect role in the battle against the Soviet system because Neoclassical economics argues that capitalism is an inherently stable system. Well, that's garbage. It's an inherently innovative system. That's why it beat the Soviets. But if you want to fight an ideological battle, then the argument about freedom and all this sort of jazz and, and equilibrium and stability as part of the ideological sale job, so that's a role too. But I think a large part of it is because it actually seduces people. Because humans are... Uh, the unique thing about us as a species, we ask the question, why? Okay. We're the only animal that asks why, so far as we know. Nobody's actually had a good intelligent conversation with a dolphin yet, you know. But we ask why. Okay. And we want explanations, so therefore we get caught up in explanations. And we also are always trying to design the perfect system. You look at all the buddy religious sects you see out on the streets, and you see them here, I'm sure, in Thailand, as well as me seeing them in England. I walk past so many people passing out leaflets, does Satan exist, you know, etc., etc. all this crap. Um, He's probably teaching in an American university. He probably was an American professor, yeah. <laughs> um, so this desire to, to produce a perfect system, neoclassical economics describes a perfect system. And you then get caught up in this, you don't believe, no, it's an ideology, but you want to show that a, free, a deregulated free market system can reach a perfect equilibrium where people's incomes reflect their contribution to society, everything's meritocratic, and there's no power. And that is, an ideal, that is an ideal world, and you become zealous about defending both the notion and trying to achieve it by making the real world look like the textbook. C can, I, can I just add two uh, things? Uh, actually, I just, can I just follow up, please? Uh, I, I just uh, comment. I, uh, you seem to reject the idea that there is a vast right-wing conspiracy, which I think there is. Oh, there's, there's a vast uh, right-wing conspiracy, but see, there's, there's vast right-wing conspiracies everywhere. 99% of them achieve the opposite of what they're trying to achieve. Uh, but they certainly got seriously funded. But I, I don't think that's enough of an explanation because I, I live amongst these people. See, I, I live with economists all the time. And I know you could, get, you could hardly find a more altruistic bunch than a bunch of neoclassical economists. They actually think they're making the world a better place and they're trying desperately to do it despite our best efforts to stop them. If, if you look over time, there's a real cyclicality about the way that um, wealth and power tends to, tends to um, <clears throat> become more focused, 
the, the sort of wealth dispersion stuff that I was talking about. It's always happened over time. And the more that happens, the more that gives um, the vested interests, you know, essentially control of all kinds of messages. Um, so I, I don't think there's... I don't think that there's a specific right-wing conspiracy as such. I just think that uh, there becomes a, and there always has throughout history, there becomes, there becomes more power vested within vested interests. Um, and, uh, and it's just something that happens, it builds up over time, and eventually it reaches its own breaking point, as it did in the 1920s. And, uh, and, and we get a, um, a more democratic approach to, uh, to, to knowledge sharing. But that actually, actually is an issue. The right-wing thing is an issue because anybody who criticises economic theory is seen as being left-wing. And that's a kiss of death in American politics. So one of the great dilemmas that I face is you know, I'm seeing as being anti-capitalist. I'm pro-capitalist. I'm pro-capitalism as it's... It's not like I've seen it in for, for environmental control. Not but the it's broken form. Not the broken form and not the financially dominated one. But as soon as you criticise economic theory, you're typecast, particularly by conventional economists, of course, as being a lefty. And therefore, your views can be dismissed. Which is one reason why I'm really quite proud of the new student movement that's occurred uh, over the last year or so. There's a bunch of student movements with various names. Rethinking Economics is one. Another is called the International Student Initiative for Pluralism in Economics complicated one, isipe.net, and they are calling for pluralism. They're not calling for a heterodox or alternative economics. They're saying for pluralism, teach us everything, including Hayek, including Marx, the whole, the whole range of theory. And that makes it impossible for them to be typecast as lefties, whereas the student movement that I was part of back at Sydney University in the 70s had a whole bunch of lefties in the place. Half of them mad as not cases, of course. Um, but that meant that the criticisms we were making of economic theory could be seen as being politically motivated rather than realist, realism motivated, which is the real reason I was, I've been involved all my life in this stuff. But, but I, I think, again, you know, what happens over time is, it, I mean, it's absolutely right, what happens over time is you get this phenomenon where um, things become more and more splintered. I, 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 don't, uh, I don't regard myself as being politically aligned or having any particular ideology, um, but I think... Uh, I think I'm opposed to most politicians and most forms of politics, most places in the world. But uh, what you do tend to find is that, um, for instance, I, I've, I, some of the stuff I've said, I found the, the same quotes actually posted on uh, some fairly extreme um, Marxist websites and also on Tea Party websites. And they both liked what I was saying. <laughs> yeah. David, is it going to be shorter well, I thought, this time? I thought Frank was going to ask. Uh, uh, Frank, okay, so Frank. Have we got a microphone for Frank? Someone? Actually, while, while we're getting a microphone to Frank, one thing I will say, totally off topic, but picking up on Steve's point about uh, humans are the only ones who can ask why, I'm, I'm not sure that's true. There was a recent article that proves that rhesus macaques have what's called metacognizance, which I don't really understand what it means, but you can train them to play video games, apparently. <laughs> Uh, Professor Steve, very interesting presentation. I thoroughly enjoyed it. Mm. Uh, my question, my concern is uh, the sustainability of our current uh, monetary system. I'm very worried about the levels of debt in both the public and the private sector. Mm. And I'm very worried about uh, the possible uh, devaluation of currencies. Uh, you, you mentioned, I think, uh, it makes a great deal of sense about uh, a government surplus is essentially taking money out of the economy, which is, mm. economy, which is certainly not a thing that we would typically want to have happen. But uh, what do you see as a sustainable level of, uh, of deficit uh, and debt? And uh, if we were able to achieve a sustainable uh, system of, uh, of mm -hmm. debt and deficit, uh, would you see a